Thank you very, very much, Larry. It's uh, wonderful to be invited back somewhere, though. I must have. That's a, that's a real pleasure. Uh, let me just warn you, I, I uh, love the title of the uh, lecture, which I had nothing to do with. I, I struggle f uh, for regional supremacy or struggle for supremacy in Latin America. It's not going to be that interesting. So <laughs> bear with me. Let me start out by, by just um, suggesting that uh, Mexico and Brazil are extraordinarily similar in so many respects. And uh, that it's uh, in some ways a pleasure to do a comparison of them because there's so much that is similar that when one takes the differences, they really sort of become magnified. And uh, just to give you an example, and I did a, a piece called Two Ways to Go Global, uh, Brazil and Mexico, about 10 years ago. In other words, how are they sort of dealing with the phenomenon of globalization? At that time, Mexico and Brazil had almost the same gross national product, the same level of economic activity, even though Mexico was 100, 100 million people in Brazil, nearly 200 million, just to take round numbers. Uh, today, Brazil has charged ahead and has uh, almost twice the national product of, of Mexico. But Mexico still has a higher per capita income. In part, Brazil's uh, uh, rapid growth has to do less with growth than with changing exchange rates. When the exchange rate is appreciated as it happened in, in Brazil, the economy looks like it's expanding. And, uh, but basically they have very similar sizes when one looks across the world. Brazil is about the sixth or seventh largest economy in the world. Mexico maybe now is about 11th or 12th. And uh, projections into the future suggest they might be fifth and sixth largest economy in the world or fourth and fifth largest economy in the world uh, with only uh, three countries in front of them, obviously, uh, or four, uh, the United States, India, and China. That's a pretty big... Uh, now, I, I know you're here to talk about BRICS and Mexico isn't a BRIC. I think it's somewhat by chance that Mexico is in a brick because the person who invented the term and said these are the four bricks uh, said he was debating whether to include either, this was in 1997, uh, Mexico or Brazil. And uh, Brazil had a nicer sound to it, bricks, <laughs> than Mexico. And why he didn't put both of them in, probably he didn't want, I don't know the answer to that. but two from the same region, perhaps. But anyway, Mexico uh, sort of lost out and, and uh, uh, Brazil became. And I was delighted to hear that I could talk about both of them, since I think they both deserve to be part of that, that group. Uh, but let me start out with the results of a recent survey in the United States that, that points out uh, a number of important things. Let me just say, in the United States, this is a survey by a reputable group uh, that asked a series of questions about Mexico, uh, primarily looking at attitudes toward Mexico, but they compared them with Brazil and some other countries like China, etc. And the result was Mexico is viewed unfavorably in the United States, overwhelmingly unfavorably, economically backward Mexico and unsafe. Brazil is almost exactly the opposite. Uh, and I can give you the numbers if, if anybody wants to see the survey. That is there, Brazil is viewed overwhelmingly favorably in the United States. It's seen as having a modern economy and it's being a country that's very safe. Now, let's just look at the facts of the two countries, however. Uh, favorably and unfavorably, Mexico today is the U.S.'s second largest trade partner. They're incredibly integrated. Uh, 
uh, economically. Uh, the car industry, for example, virtually almost all the cars you buy, there's something made in Mexico in those cars, if not the car itself. Mexico is now the fourth largest exporter of cars, and I just use that as an example. Um, in fact, it's larger than China. It's second only to Canada as a trade partner, and uh, there are several projections that have uh, Mexico becoming the U.S.'s largest trade partner by uh, in a half a dozen years or so. Uh, so, uh, and um, it's also interesting. Ten percent of the uh, U.S. population is of Mexican origin. Twenty-five percent of immigrants to this country are of Mexican origin, and 15% of our imported oil is from Mexico. Uh, Brazil, to compare the two, is uh, only the eighth trading partner of the United States, uh, and uh, where Mexico represents about 12% of U.S. trade, Brazil represents 2%. Uh, Second issue, the modern economy. Uh, basically, Brazil exports commodities now. Uh, about 80%, uh, no, uh, top five exports of Brazil are all commodities, from iron ore to soybeans uh, to uh, uh, other agricultural products mainly. While 80% of Mexico's exports are manufactured goods. Yet the survey suggested that Mexico has the backward economy. Now I want to give full credit to Brazil that its agricultural economy is very modern, high tech and all. But the Brazilians are really scraping. They're very nervous about the whole process of maybe they're de-industrializing and moving back instead of forward. But it's interesting that the Mexican economy, like I say, is almost all manufactured goods. Um, Safe and unsafe. Actually, uh, we sort of only hear news stories about how dangerous Mexico is, the crime and violence, and it's very, very nasty and brutal. We know that. But, you know, there's more homicides per capita in Brazil than in Mexico. Uh, and there's certainly a higher use rate of drug use in Mexico than in Brazil. I just quickly go over these to show how this huge difference in perception of the two countries is totally wrong. I mean, they're much more similar to one another, and in many respects, uh, they, ha they have it backwards. Um, uh, I think part of the problem, and this is, uh, you know, just maybe it's a national trait, it may be an international trait, it's certainly a national trait, is it's very hard to keep an image of a country with sort of more, than, it's hard to keep in one's mind more than one image of a country. In other words, we think of Mexico now, we automatically begin to think of the crime, violence, drug trade, because that's what so much of the news stories is. And uh, I remember back when uh, Vincente Fox was inaugurated as the first uh, sort of opposition president to be elected in 70 years. For a period of at least 18 months between his election in uh, July uh, 2000 until uh, September 11, 2001, there virtually wasn't a single, uh, uh, every news story at that point was favorable about Mexico, about Mexico's transition to democracy, about the new democracy in Mexico. And we had an image that was very positive. Now it focuses only on crime and violence, and that's a big mistake uh, with regard to, to Mexico. And with Brazil, Brazil has been touted as this country that's on the rise. It's a country that's uh, going to be the host to the World Cup and then the Olympics. It's uh, growing very rapidly. The cover of The Economist magazine showed it sort of the, 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 the Christ figure that sits in uh, Rio de Janeiro welcoming visitors was taking off to the moon and uh, article after article was about the rise of Brazil and uh, while all the articles about Mexico were uh, 
about crime and violence. Well, this week, The Economist magazine uh, had headlined the Mexico and talked about the rise of Mexico. So again, we, you know, the, the, the similarities and the, uh, uh, but I think that we really have to probe uh, much deeper than this simple survey. And that's what I'm going to try to do today. And I'm going to hope to leave a lot of time for questions and answers. So uh, if I pass over anything, feel free to raise questions. Uh, there's so much to cover. Uh, I was explaining to uh, my chauffeur uh, <laughs> uh, that, uh, you know, it's twice as hard to write about two countries as it is to write about one because you've got to explain their comparison, plus you have to explain the source of the comparison in both countries. So you have at least three times as much work. Um, but anyway, um, the Brazil image, uh, as, you, as I said, has risen enormously, and particularly in the last 10 years or so. I mean, it's, it's really remarkable uh, worldwide. Uh, Brazil is really... Uh, achieved uh, star power in, in some ways, that uh, this was a country that can do no wrong. In a worldwide poll, it's come out as the second most admired country. It's the most certainly admired of the BRIC countries, the uh, uh, China, India, and Russia being way beneath Brazil. Brazil rises. Uh, it's clearly it's become one of the uh, leading candidates for a permanent seat if, of, at the United Nations if there should be any opening whatsoever. Uh, I mentioned the Olympics and the World Cup. And um, the question is, what led to Brazil's rise? And was it so spectacular to deserve all that? And how does it compare to Mexico in that period that this rise took place? Uh, no doubt in my mind that the most important part of the Brazil rise was its economic performance. And that had two elements to it. Uh, one is what I would call just the sheer economic policy making. Uh, it showed a level Brazil of discipline and competence really from the mid-90s, the outset of the government of Fernando Henrique Cardoso, uh, that uh, it had had inflation of 5,000% a year, and it was quickly sort of dissipated by what they called the Plano Real, Real. Uh, and since then, it's paid its debts on time, its debt has de de decreased very markedly as a percentage of GDP. Uh, it's generated year in and year out what they call a primary surplus, keeping inflation low, and uh, enormous policy continuity between a center, center-right president, Fernando Enrique Cardoso, and a center-left, left president, uh, Lula, which the markets all predicted would not happen. It did happen. And uh, there's no question that this, this continuity and the, just the quality of economic policy. Uh, the actual performance, besides the policy, was really pretty mediocre, however, until about 2003. I mean, they got the economy under control, the inflation was knocked down, but really there was very little growth, and it was what growth there was was punctuated by the Asia crisis in 1997-1998, and then the campaign for president began in 1999. The election was in 2000, and the economy, uh, everybody was waiting to see what kind of president Lula might make, and everybody was worried. The IMF had to come in, and uh, so it was really not until 2004 that's not so far back that Brazil started to grow. 2003 it was actually uh, had a negative growth rate. And it sustained that growth right through 2008 when we had the global financial crisis. So it had four years of growth. But the major accomplishment with economic performance, it managed to avoid the impact, managed to sidestep the impact of the economic crisis. Uh, 
where we know what happened in the U.S. and Europe and in lots of other countries. Uh, but it uh, basically Brazil just uh, uh, had zero growth or maybe a slightly negative growth in 2009, while Mexico uh, had a negative 6.5% growth to give the other extreme. So, you know, and that was what I think really cemented that Brazil really... Uh, and then the next year it had a blistering pace of growth, which was one of the largest in the world of 7.5%. And this even sort of put the nail in, the, well, it wasn't the coffin, it was the nail in the crown, uh, uh, that this was a country really on the move, that it was not only avoided the global economic crisis, it managed to sort of grow at the fastest pace of almost any country outside of China in the world. Uh, now we have uh, a slowdown though in, in 2011. It dropped from uh, 2010 from 7.5% to about 2.7%. And this year it's going to be 0.5% or lower. So all of a sudden people are beginning to say what's going on a little bit for Brazil. And of course, as I mentioned before, it, it had a certain illusion of faster growth than this even that I mentioned because of this, its currency was appreciating so rapidly. There was so much investment in Brazil from outside that everybody was touting Brazil as, as really the country of the future that its appreciation, it almost doubled the value of its currency. It went from above three to about 1.6. 1.5 even at one point, which automatically doubles the size of your gross national product. And uh, it, 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 that, that was also, so you had not only fast growth, but an illusion of even faster. Uh, and finally, to put the, uh, sort of the, uh, to, to make it even clearer, was that Brazil discovers the huge oil reserves. And Brazil is already a country that's almost energy independent. Uh, it's with its uh, uh, bio, bio, bio fuels, the ethanol fuels, with uh, hydroelectric. It's uh, very close to being energy independent. And then it finds these huge oil fields. And what could be by a rich country that has managed its, itself well, managed its oil resources, now finds huge trove of oil. Uh, all that comes together, I think, as why Brazil sort of emerged economically, at least. Mexico's performance during this period was much weaker. Uh, its growth prior to the global crisis was averaging maybe 1.6 to 1.7 percent from 2000 to 2008. Very low, fumbling rate of growth. Uh, maybe less than half of Brazil's rate of growth in the same period. Uh, and I mentioned before, it saw a precipitous drop in its, its uh, income, if in, in its uh, 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 growth rate in 2009 by the, one of the worst drops in anywhere in the world, with six and a half percent. Really, the, Mexico was slammed by the U.S. recession, and we can talk about exactly why it got so badly slammed. Other problems on Mexico, on the economy, why it looked like it was slipping. Uh, oil was declining, oil production. Uh, it declined something like between 2004 and 2011 by almost 25%. Uh, and projections were beginning to suggest that Mexico would become a net oil importer very soon. Uh, it's not surprising that Brazil was going up and Mexico. Uh, and secondly, unlike Brazil, the Mexico peso was not appreciating at all, so there was no illusion. Uh, um, overall, GMP began to sort of, in comparison to Brazil, I said it was about the same in 2002. By 2010, it was half of Brazil's. Uh, now, there are other things that, that are responsible for Brazil's rise, not only the economy. Uh, I think Brazilian leadership was really exemplary uh, for a period of 
well, 16 years during the presidencies of Fernando Enrique Cardoso and Lula. I mean, these were two men that really were really uh, world-class leaders. They were recognized by that, by the U.S. and various other countries. I mean, they really had uh, a capacity for leadership that really Brazil had not really seen before, and uh, most other countries did not as well. Uh, Mexico had, uh, sort of a, was, uh, uh, let's say, disappointed at least by its uh, first democratic presidents. They really didn't perform the way they had been uh, uh, expected to perform, and certainly nowhere near the kind of leadership that Brazil had. Um, the other difference between the two countries. Uh, Brazil did a lot more initiatives internationally. It's sort of, and again, I can go into detail about this, but it really severely challenged the U.S. on several key issues, including uh, free trade area. The Americas was probably one of the most important negotiations uh, on the World Trade Organization. Uh, sort of developed a strong uh, connection to Iran. And this was happening at a time when the U.S. didn't have the greatest uh, image overseas. This was the time after the Iraq war uh, and uh, the Bush presidency where the U.S. was sort of viewed with some degree of uh, distaste in many parts. And uh, Brazil whether it did so deliberately or not, I'm not sure, but really it took some advantage of that and, was, and sort of was a country that could say no to the United States. Um, uh, the uh, Mexicans really have much greater difficulty in doing that. They did in the case of the Iraq invasion. They said they were going to vote against it if it came to the UN. But by and large, the close ties to the U.S. that make the U.S. for Mexico a reference point. That when Mexicans think of foreign policy, the first thing that comes to their mind is the relationship with the United States. Eighty percent of trade, of Mexico's trade, uh, eighty percent of its exports come to the United States. Uh, it has to be the, the reference point. Uh, it has far fewer degrees of freedom than Brazil uh, on many, many fronts. Uh, and in many ways, Mexico itself retreated from an international position. It, uh, if you talk to anybody in Latin America, Mexico was seemingly absent from Latin America. Uh, and particularly uh, unhappy were the Central Americans. Uh, who really felt that uh, Mexico should have been closer to them and sort of been more helpful. Um, but Mexico uh, was not. Then there's, there's a couple of other issues that I think are responsible for Brazil's rise. I won't go into them uh, in great deal, but the, uh, what I call the ethical dimensions of countries. In other words, there's some countries that aren't big and powerful and wealthy that sort of, uh, sort of rise up and are sort of viewed, uh, Canada is a country like that, a uh, Sweden. Uh, and it generally is because they have, you know, sort of they're worried about certain kinds of international issues that have taken on importance, whether it's peacekeeping or it's international aid or sort of fighting HIV AIDS or what have you. And, uh, uh, and when I say, and then their internal uh, operations, you know, they tend to be countries that are very democratic and they tend to be countries that have done a good job at reducing poverty and inequality in their countries. Uh, and Brazil has done pretty well on some of these issues, not on all of them, and we're going to get to some of the problems. Uh, it has one of the world's most effective HIV AIDS programs worldwide, Brazil. Uh, poverty and inequality are huge, but they did make progress over the past few years for the first time in um, virtually in the, in the country's history to really uh, shave back poverty just enormous amounts. 
uh, and uh, particularly on the race issue, which Brazil had been, uh, we can discuss this at some time, far more racist than, than, than it's usually portrayed. And by and large, over the past 15, 20 years, has made enormous advances, at least in opening up legal paths and opening up their institutions. They now have a black Supreme Court justice. Uh, the universities all have affirmative action programs. The Foreign Service has an affirmative action plan. And again, that's the kind of ethical uh, joining of, of, of countries that becomes sort of this international uh, uh, image. Um, and uh, Mexico had some, it, it turned to democracy, uh, did less to communicate uh, what its positive side. Its programs on poverty, for example, predated those of Brazil. It was the one that invented the conditional cash transfers that have made such a difference. Uh, uh, these are programs that provide uh, uh, monthly payments to poor families who make sure their kids are vaccinated and go to school. And like I say, these were really invented in Mexico. And uh, Brazil picked them up and expanded them and gave a great deal of publicity to them, probably much more than uh, the Mexicans did. Mexicans have taken uh, initiatives on climate change that are very, they had the, the, the last meeting on climate change. Climate change hasn't gone very far, but Mexico deserves some credit for trying to take some leadership there. And uh, Brazil got much more credit for its uh, Rio environmental meeting back in 1990 and uh, Rio plus 20 meeting uh, uh, last year. Uh, Again, Brazil has a way with uh, public relations. Uh, then, of course, there's one thing that Mexico is very handicapped by is the crime and violence, which tends to color its international uh, vision. And for some reason, even though Brazil has a higher homicide rate, Brazil has managed to be able to uh, be viewed, and uh, I don't want to say that pure publicity, but Brazil's crime and violence is seen as a public safety issue. There's a problem in Sao Paulo, there's a problem in Minas Gerais, there's a problem in, in uh, this city or that city, but it doesn't rise to the level of a national security problem. In Mexico, it's almost viewed as a national security problem. I think Somebody in our military called it a, you know, possible failed state, etc. And like I say, Brazil has terrible problems, but they're somehow, and what the difference is, I still have not, I mean, the Mexican uh, crime and violence has reached levels of, you know, brutality and cruelty that's, that's very high. But uh, like I say, uh, Mexico, is, uh, Brazil is also a very dangerous place, and yet, there's sort of viewed very differently. And uh, somehow, I, I think there is something to the fact that uh, crime and violence may be more of a security issue for, for Brazil than it is for Mexico, uh, for Mexico rather than Brazil. And I'm not sure why. I mean, that's uh, that I'd love to hear any, any, any thoughts on that. Well, um, let me just be very quick because uh, I want to leave time for questions um, and I see lots of pages left. Um, let me just say in the past year we've seen as I mentioned something of a shift. All of a sudden Mexico is sort of mounting something of a comeback. It's very interesting the Mexican ambassador in Washington has been uh, speaking for the past two years on the fact that uh, you know Brazil ain't that great and Mexico is better than it looks and um, and certainly, uh, there was so much, I, I remember uh, a report that came out of the dialogue, in fact, I think saying when Obama was uh, elected that he would have two big problems in Latin America. One was the rise of Brazil, which was going to be more of a challenge to manage, and the deterioration of Mexico. And that was unfair, I mean, basically because uh, Brazil wasn't rising, its sustainability wasn't so clear, 
and Mexico wasn't deteriorating that badly. And uh, yet, you know, sort of we tend to sort of want to sort of push in, 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 in one way or another the images and, and views. Uh, but like I said, in the last two years, Mexico has been growing faster than Brazil. Uh, and it's become the favorite of international investors by now and uh, featured on the cover of, uh, of The Economist. And predictions are now that Mexico uh, is going to do better than Brazil. Uh, at least The Economist has that, that for a variety uh, of reasons. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, there's at least some uh, predictions in, from the Wall Street banks and all that Mexico, which now has a gross national product uh, level of economic activity that's between 55 and 60 percent of Brazil, is now projected in the next five or six years to surpass Brazil by some. So, I mean, it's, it's really a, a very interesting to watch. I also think it's important, and I'm going to just read these off, that both countries have huge handicaps as they try to move forward. That I've been talking more about the positive side, except for the crime and violence. But uh, some of the most critical are deteriorating infrastructure. Both countries have let their infrastructure really uh, go. Both of them, uh, particularly Brazil, more than they balance their budgets basically on the back of their infrastructure. That's the easiest politically to take money or not spend money on building, repairing, maintenance than it is to take it out of pensions and poverty programs and health programs and schools. So that's what they did. And they, their infrastructure has, you know, I mean, there's go to any airport in Brazil and you'll see right away or a seaport or a road. Uh, uh, fiscal policies are both countries need uh, reform, uh, uh, major reforms. Uh, uh, Brazil spends more than any country in the hemisphere per capita. It also uh, taxes more. It, in fact, its tax rates are higher than the U.S. tax rates. And someone put it that Brazil just goes out, spends, 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 then it goes and tax, tax, tax. It doesn't have a Grover Norquist uh, movement yet in Brazil. Uh, Mexico has just the other problem. It taxes too little, and it sort of takes the money away from Pemex, the oil company, which doesn't have money to invest in new oil exploration. Uh, so both countries uh, have to really do a job, and that's what Peña Neto has been promising and what the president of Brazil has been promising. But these are hard things to change, as we know very, very well, to cut spending or raise taxes. Uh, as we approach our own fiscal cliff. Uh, also, uh, education is very dismal. And if you look at international results, enrollment has grown enormously in both countries. Both countries could now say, you know, sort of are graduating almost 100%, 80, 90% from their uh, primary schools. They're going to secondary schools. But the quality, whenever they take international tests, just they fall very short, and that's something that has to, that's going to really be a handicap in the future. Inequality, huge inequalities, among the worst in the world. Uh, just a quick number: Brazil, the upper 20 percent of the population gets almost 60 percent of the income; the bottom 20 percent gets less than 3 percent, and Mexico is about the same. Mexico is a little, little better. And finally, there's huge levels of corruption in both countries, and we can talk about that. Brazil seems to be making more headway, but one wonders if they don't have more headway to make. <laughs> uh, but it's that those are all, I would say, sort of five real serious obstacles to both countries that have to be kept in mind as we, you know, sort of praise their economic policies, as we praise their growth rates, as we praise a whole lot of other things. But the deteriorating infrastructure, the need for better tax and spending policies, education, and movement toward greater equality. Uh, 
what about the future? Uh, let me just say what the difference is, and I'm going to do this again quickly. Uh, the one thing that Brazil really does have that Mexico is maybe beginning to acquire, but it's very, is far more confidence in itself. I mean, Brazil, you go to Brazil, even with the problems over the past two years, the Brazil, whether it's elite or workers, they, you know, unemployment, for example, is still very low in Brazil. There's sort of a feeling of confidence in the country that they can do it. They know how to do it. They've come out of difficult times before. They've shown that they are, are a big international country. And uh, they, they, they seem to know how far they've come. And they sort of just have this, this confidence that Braz uh, Mexicans tend to be a little more cynical, a little more skeptical, a little more uncertain about where they're headed. Uh, uh, one, th th this is maybe more personal observation, but sort of, you know, uh, you have to read the columnists and talk and you just get a sense that the confidence resides in Brazil more than Mexico. Secondly, uh, Brazil, as I mentioned, has more degrees of freedom than Mexico. In other words, Mexico really does have, you know, it's just close. The geography is, uh, someone once said it's destiny. It may not be full destiny, but it influences very hard. And uh, Brazil uh, has, uh, well, let me, let me put it another way. I mentioned this before that Mexico, 80% of its exports go to the United States. Added to that, the huge tourism that comes from the United States to Mexico. Add to that the remittances, $25 uh, billion dollars a year in remittances. This is an enormous economic connection. I mean, there's no way that the, the U.S. and Mexico can really separate. They're integrated economically, and one only has to look at the supply chains between the two countries, you know. The U.S. sends a motor to Brazil, it comes back as a half-finished car, it's sent back to be painted. Uh, I mean, the integration of the, of the two. Uh, and uh, there's just no, no, no getting around that. And while Brazil has 80% that goes to the U.S., uh, Mexico has 80% that goes to the U.S., Brazil, 80%, it sends 20% to China, 20% to Europe, 20% to the United States, and 20% to the rest of Latin America. So when I say it has more degrees of freedom, you can see now, clearly Brazil is not going to be helped if China slows down and Europe collapses. Uh, that diversity and that uh, degrees of freedom is not going to help very much. But it's not going to help the U.S. very much, and it's not going to help Mexico either very much. So, uh, but nonetheless, Brazil does have more choices. Uh, uh, let me just. So, what do I see in the long run? And let me just. Uh, uh, I think Brazil is more likely over time to become what might be called a global powerhouse. Uh, in other words, in the sense of really being a country that sort of, you know, uh, you know China, the US, uh, maybe Russia again, maybe India, uh, maybe a united Europe again. Uh, Brazil, uh, in, in, in uh, why? Because first of all, it's just a bigger country. I mean, it does have almost twice the population of... of uh, secondly, is that, you know, the, the Mexico is going to be just too influenced. It's too close to the sun, if you like. That, uh, in other words, it just cannot act as independently as Brazil. And I think that that's going to make a big difference. I mean, it may benefit enormously economically, it may benefit in a million ways from being close to the United States, but it's going to keep it from being an independent, sort of strong. Uh, and there's, there's no other country that's quite like that, uh, uh, that, 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 that has that kind of relationship, and that's, that's something else. Uh, in fact, I think that probably Mexico 
has a more secure future in front of it. Uh, probably has a more likely to be a, a top level economic performer in part not only because of the U.S.'s economy and its being, being integrated into it, but it forces a certain higher level of discipline on the Mexican economy because it's so closely associated. Uh, and I think that the perception will be that Mexico and the United States are just tied. It's going to be very, very difficult for them I mean, that's, I th in some sense, the main problem for Mexico and the United States is how to manage. And we haven't managed it terribly well, this both a economic and demographic integration between the two countries. And of course, Brazil doesn't have to really worry about that. It lives in a very peaceful area. It's the big guy on the block, not threatened by anybody. And I think from that position, it's, it's more likely to become the global, global power. But I suspect that Mexico over the years will be a more secure power. Thank you. 45 minutes, half. Questions and answers? Um, uh, no, uh, a couple things. Uh, with regard to Brazil, uh, do you regret uh, Petrobras? is, of course, the, the giant oil company down there that has it's a, an actual mon monopoly, but more or less. Uh, has a monopoly. Yeah. Uh, does that represent a, a vulnerability in any way to Brazil have that kind of uh, structure well, with regard to the, its uh, control? Well, it's interesting because Petrobras was privatized. I mean, uh, and uh, as a privatized company, it actually functioned very, very well. Now, the, uh, that doesn't mean it, the state didn't get involved, but it, uh, this basically, uh, I think they have a board that half of the members of the board are government appointed and half are from the private sector, but it's the government that, you know, really calls the shots. I mean, the, it's the government that makes most of the major decisions. Uh, but the fact that they have to worry about bondholders and stockholders and all does give it a certain independence of the government. It's not a government-run operation. And it really was seen as almost a model. Uh, that and Norway, of course, is the really sort of uh, top-level model for a, for a uh, uh, a state-run oil company. Uh, but Brazil's Petrobras was certainly the best in Latin America, uh, uh, particularly as uh, Petivesa in Venezuela sort of has gone through its, its deterioration. Uh, and Pemex, of course, is, is so uh, sort of integrated into the state that uh, they say that the, uh, the, the head of Petrobras is really not the President of Petro, uh, Petro Pemex, the, he, the president of Pemex is not the head of Pemex, nor is it the energy minister, it's the finance minister. The finance minister sort of decides how much he's going to cover from Pemex each year, how much they're going to pay for a barrel of oil, a whole series of, uh, it's, it's just part of the government and uh, it uh, makes it very, very difficult uh, for Pemex. But as far as Petrobras has been the model, now there's some indication that Brazil is a little bit unhappy. It sees that it wants more control over its oil. Particularly it now has this big uh, potential out in the Atlantic and uh, uh, everybody wants a piece of that and so why not sort of raise the price of it and uh, take more control. This is get more, uh, I think that that's probably a mistake on Brazil's part. I think they've done very well the way it's been managed. And, um, but uh, on the whole, um, it's just very, very hard to know whether Petrobras, if Petrobras can maintain its independence, which it has in terms of, it operates like a company, a state-owned company perhaps, but not like a state ministry or a bureaucracy. 
And uh, everyone says it's technology for deep sea and it's technology generally. It's market management has been, you know, really world class. Um, where it's going to head now with, uh, you know, when, when the salt fields, when the pre-salt fields, this enormous discovery of oil in Brazil was found, a number of, of journalists called me and asked me what I thought about it. I said, you know, Brazil is very lucky that um, it didn't discover oil 25 years ago. Because almost all the countries that discover oil at the outset of their development end up sort of squandering a good share of it. We see that in the case of Venezuela, Mexico, uh, and uh, in, in a number of others. And now they have a, a very good oil company that knows how to manage it. If the government sort of allows that to continue, I think they'll, they'll be in pretty good shape. Because they do, they do uh, are able to sort of bring in other oil companies. They're allowed to contract them. They're allowed to uh, let other companies work in commission. Companies can invest in Petrobras. So it, it really does operate like a, a, a good company, not like a, like I say, a government agency. They seem to be investing huge amounts in R&D. Uh, remember that, that, R, that brand new R&D facility along the coast, that thing is almost a mile long. Oh my God, yeah. Well, it's interesting because that's one of the, one of the people who writes about Pemex says that the real problem with Pemex is they've let R&D and training go to pot, that they've just sort of let that, that off and they just have lost the capacity for innovation. And as oil gets more expensive to get out of the ground, that, that capacity not only to innovate, but to actually go out and sort of recognize innovation by others and bringing it back to Mexico is just not there. Right. What's interesting is the uh, the way the government control of Petrobras is ensuring that they maintain the environmental control because you know Chevron was taken to court by Brazil for leaks, but so is Petrobras. The environment right. in Brazil is just as just as hard on Petrobras's oil leaks as they are on Chevron's oil leaks. It's, uh, so it's a, yeah, I mean they're taking a very but I think that you really use the Chevron to really show off a point that you better be very careful here. We, you know, because we don't want anything to screw this up. We, this is a big show for us too. Please. Mexico and what should be the, the role of Mexico for the future? For the future. Yeah. Should be more interested to North America and leave South America or should to be the bridge between South America and North America? And the other question, sir, Mexico always believes in, in respect of the country, no intervention on the domestic problems. A strong economy should to be a, a more participation of the military programs of Mexico and the war and globalization or what it means. Hmm. Boy, those are two tough questions. I mean, I, d I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, uh, in some ways, I don't think Mexico is, is really struggling a whole lot with the first question. You know, I think that Mexicans, from my sense, there may be Mexicans who think otherwise, but by and large, if you read, uh, which I do, uh, you know, the Mexican newspapers, and you see how much is written about Mexico in Latin America, or Mexico's relations with Latin America, and how much written about Mexico in the United States, I think the choice has already been made, basically, that they're integrating with the United States. And maybe from that point of view, they can then come back to Latin America. They clearly have uh, taken some leadership in setting up this, uh, what is it, CELAC, the Commission, the uh, Community of Latin American Nations, which brings together all Latin American nations. But somehow, uh, you know, just seeing 
Peñaneto, the kinds of initiatives he's going to take, the, uh, that it just seems like there's just, I mean, he did make a trip to South America, was not particularly uh, exciting or, or uh, so my sense is that Mexico uh, has more or less selected that, chosen that route. Uh, and whether it's right or wrong, you know, I'm not sure, but you know, it's, it almost seems somewhat inevitable once you, and uh, uh, like I say, it might want to make a new effort in Latin America, but I don't think it's made much of an effort. And the Central American countries are particularly, it's worthwhile talking to people there who see Mexico as not sort of, you know, the way Mexico says the United States is not living up to its responsibilities. In Latin America, that's the way, you know, they talk about Mexico and Central America, that it once was much more engaged in the region. Um, the role of the, the Mexican military, it's interesting. I think uh, my own preference would, I'd love to see Mexico as part of international peacekeeping and, and the like. I mean, the fact uh, Mexico was not able to send troops to Haiti, for example. Uh, uh, while well, they did send them to the United States to for the Katrina hurricane, that was, but I, I think that it would be worthwhile if they played more of that kind of international role. Now, it's understandable why they don't uh, as well. I mean, you know, they, they certainly don't want to sort of give any reason to the United States to operate outside its uh, borders. And uh, but I think that it's sort of almost as Mexico gets wealthier, more developed, more uh, uh, mature, uh, that it has a responsibility to participate in something like the, 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 the peacekeeping or security in Haiti or some parts of Africa and Asia, etc. And I, I think it should. development indicators right. of uh, these countries. However, one of the biggest issues in all of our countries uh, in, in the region is not the, the growth itself, but how we distribute this new, new uh, uh, wealth. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of a paradox, because the richer the country, the unhappier the poor. And, <laughs> and, and that's, that's, uh, that's an interesting thing. And I would like you, sir, to elaborate a little bit on how these two countries are or how do you see the trends on, on this particular issue? Well, uh, I'm not sure you're right that the richer the country, the more unhappy the poor, but we can discuss that. Because, because we don't have strong ways to distribute the wealth on, on, on our countries. We don't have a, a strong... Well, let me say, it seems to me the poor in Brazil are happier now that Brazil has gotten richer than they were before when Brazil was poorer. But uh, uh, no, I think that that's, that's a good question. And uh, I think you have to do both. I mean, you can't distribute without growing because everybody will protect. I mean, the worst situation is where a country is stagnant. So everybody is fighting to keep what they have. And if you're growing, the possibilities, the, the opportunities are just much greater for distribution. And, it's interesting, uh, Brazil has reduced poverty really pretty sharply in the past, uh, I don't know, dozen, 15 years or so. I mean, it, uh, I don't have the exact figures, maybe I do here somewhere. Uh, but in any event, the, 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 the poverty rate has dropped, I think, from something like 40% to 20%, that, that level of magnitude. And uh, the, they, they've tried, the World Bank has done a lot of work on trying to sort out, sort out where does that poverty improvement come from? And about half of it, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. About 20%, according to these figures, I don't know how good they are, but I presume they're smart people that are doing this, they're honest people, comes from the social programs, the two, two so one, the uh, uh, Bolsa Familia, the program, this conditional trans cash transfer, uh, but, and another, um, 
uh, and from increased uh, expenditures on education, about 20, 25%, and the rest comes from the growth. So you can't get over the hump of poverty without, now, now the big problem is how you uh, move the, you know, what they call uh, the middle income trap, Brazil, Mexico are both middle income countries. According to the World Bank, they're upper middle income countries. And that's right where the difficulty starts for growth. That when countries reach somewhere between 10 and $15,000 a year per capita, is relatively, lots of countries reach that. And, and Brazil and Mexico are now toward the top end of that. They're around uh, 12, 13, 14, depending on how you measure. But to move that to the rich country, to become over 20, over 25,000, very small number of countries have made that jump. North Korea is, uh, North Korea, South Korea <laughs> is one of them. Uh, and, but there's very, very few others that have made that, that leap. Uh, uh, and that's where Brazil and Mexico are both now. They're in this middle income situation that, again, uh, a, a study by, I think it was the World Bank, it might be the Inter-American Development Bank, talks about this, this middle income and what they have to do. Some of the weaknesses I pointed out, the infrastructure, inequality, uh, lack of good education, uh, are some of the problems that the countries face in making that jump. Oh, do I have to make choices? <laughs> Go ahead. This one was an easy one. <laughs> Could you just comment a little bit on uh, Brazil's relationship and interest in Africa? You know, it, it's something I don't know a whole lot about, to be, to be frank. Uh, I do know that Brazil for ever, I lived there in the uh, early 70s, late 60s. And there were already close relations with the Portuguese-speaking part of Africa, uh, particularly Angola and Mozambique, which, you know, were in the midst of their uh, sort of colonial wars at the time. And then as they emerged from them, uh, Brazil kept a very close, I mean, it was, uh, you know, that, that sort of Portuguese-speaking relationship. Uh, uh, lots of Brazilian experts and uh, advisors and, uh, were sent to those countries. And I think they, prov they, they had active aid programs that were very active. I think in more recent years, Brazil has been taking a more active role more generally and in fact has a program with the, uh, with the United States to work with African countries. Somehow my phone is ringing. My broker, don't worry. <laughs> no, uh, but and so and it's uh, really trying to develop a foreign aid program, which it hasn't had. And uh, I think the only place it's really uh, working hard at it is Africa. I mean, it's not in the other Latin American countries. Is you know, it makes loans. It uses some of its agencies to finance developments in and around Latin America, but in Africa it really does have a, 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 a budding uh, foreign aid program and how far it will go. That's one of the things that Mexico should have if, if uh, Mexico wanted to sort of do more, for example, in Central America. A regular funded aid program. It's got to take the initiative. Tell them that. <laughs> Oh, sorry. You, you, uh, he was next, and then, okay. Uh, sir, Sean O'Carroll. When, uh, when a nation grows in power, as Brazil has, it can enhance regional security, or it can be destabilizing, or some mix of those. Oh. Um, how do you think Brazil is doing in this, in this area, especially in regards to its Spanish-speaking neighbors? Oof, let's, in general, let, let me say, uh, I've characterized Brazil as a country that's reached the point where it can often, not always, but often block initiatives it doesn't like in international, uh, 
In other words, it was able to block the free trade area of the Americans. Uh, I can go into detail on that. It was able to basically uh, prevent uh, an agreement at the uh, Doha negotiations, first in Cancun and then later, uh, I can't remember whether it was Geneva or I think it was Geneva. Uh, so it's reached the point, and one can point to a number of other things that, it, you know, the U.S. wanted a uh, military treaty with Colombia, and it was able to basically block that because basically it was in the midst of, it was creating some controversy. It hadn't been approved by the Supreme Court, and then the Santos government came in and decided not to do it. It's reached that stage where, it, like I say, it can, but it hasn't yet reached the stage where it can get things it wants. In other words, that it wasn't able to formulate an alternative to the free trade area of America or to come up with an approach to the Doha round of trade negotiations that would be more acceptable. Uh, and I think that that's, it, it tried very hard, and this is a, a very controversial uh, and I think that there's so much uh, uh, sort of problems on all sides of this, but when it tried to join with Turkey to negotiate an agreement with Iran about the, uh, their, uh, uh, how they would manage their nuclear program. Uh, very interesting chain of events, but, but by and large, uh, the Brazilians uh, sort of didn't do as well as they might have. Uh, they did better than the United States gave them credit for. The United States was partially responsible for, for this. Uh, and in the end, uh, I don't think it damaged very much. I don't think it gained very much. It showed that Brazil sort of could get a presence. Now, my sense is that Dilma is backing away from that, 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 that there's been a change from uh, Lula to Dilma. Dilma is much more concerned with what goes on at home, is less flamboyant overseas, is less willing to sort of make, take, make big statements or try to affect or influence. My guess is it'll take a while before Brazil is sort of, you know, can take the leadership on an issue and see it through. Does, does that, that was your question, right? You didn't have, did you have a second? Oh, in the... And, and, and I, I think that's a big question. That's a big question that I've asked, and I, I still don't have a full. Does Brazil want an integrated South America? In other words, a group of countries. Does it, does it see itself as leading, let's say, a group of countries like Europe? In other words, a real integration scheme or far more than, than, or does it see its role basically, you know, we need to become an internationally important uh, player to have a basically a calm backyard, that there's no conflicts there, that it basically behaves itself, it pays its bills, it's, uh, you know, peaceful, it, you know, that it's not, a, it's not something that creates difficulties for Brazil as it sort of pursues its more international. Well, I guess it's somewhere between that. I don't think Brazil is really ready for integration. I don't think Brazil wants to give up really an ounce of its sovereignty to any other country at this point. I think what it's looking for, and I think I could sort of make the case uh, for basically, you know, it wants a non-conflictive, low-tension region in which it sort of lives and works. That's been its objective for long. No, nobody's threatening anybody else. Nobody's intervening. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're sort of, uh, it, it's a neighborhood that doesn't embarrass me, but I don't have to do a lot. And I think that there may be some actual contradictions over time, though. If Brazil takes more of a leadership role internationally, it'll be expected to do more back. And then you, you get these kinds of conflicts. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgot about it. 
Uh, just had a question. You were, I didn't see you. You were in camouflage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, you, you said the per capita, uh, Mexican per capita income was higher than Brazil's per capita income. Is that? Let me just, I'll give you the exact numbers. How do you like that? I, I, I actually looked them up. On a dollar term, in other words, no corrections, no adjustments, no fooling around. Uh, Brazil is actually a little higher now. It's about 12,800 12, uh, 12, per person, and Brazil is about 10,000. Uh, Mexico is 10,000, 10,200. But if you adjust it to the purchasing power, which is the important thing inside the country, that Brazilians can only buy with their 12,800, about 11,800 worth of products. While the Mexicans with 10,000 per capita can buy close to 15. So the average, there is no average, you realize. Mexican is better off than the average Brazilian according to this, in purchasing power. In terms of economic might overseas, you rather travel as a Brazilian. Your currency is worth more. That's the difference. Sir, you, uh, you mentioned uh, early on the discussion about the perspectives and, uh, between American, or American perspectives of Mexico versus Brazil. It seems like Brazil has succeeded and they've got a great story and Mexico is about to succeed and they've got a terrible story. So uh, my, my question is, do you see that as having any causal input in the future? So if Mexico was able to claim control of the narrative, would that amplify their future success? Oh, boy. I mean, it would guarantee it if they could control it. Well, just the, <laughs> not just the situation, but the narrative. No, no, but I mean, I'm what I'm saying, yeah, I think the narrative does feed back. I mean, it creates, I mean, you know, if Mexicans reading their newspapers every day about crime and violence, I mean, it's, I mean, when I mentioned Brazil having more confidence, I think that comes in some sense from the narrative that the country begins to believe. If you tell a country they're on the rise, they're the new world power. They're sort of, you know, no country's ever had the Olympics and the World Soccer Cup at the same time. And you go on and on, you know, people begin to believe that. And on just the country, if no, you know, your economy is deteriorating, your crime and violence, you're unsafe. People, you know, so I think this is, you know, we live in a world that everybody's news story becomes everybody's news story. And, uh, you know, the Mexicans are very, very attentive to what goes on in the United States, what the United States says about them. You read the Mexican newspapers, AP stories are, you know, and, you know, uh, President Obama says this about Mexico or <laughs> Pentagon spokesman says this about Mexico. It's all printed. And the same thing in Brazil. The Brazil tends to... Uh, so to be more positive than negative, and, and Mexico has tended to be more negative, aside from the past, let's say, year or so, and uh, it's relatively recent. I mean, this is this story by the Economist. I'm sure is, it means a lot to the Mexican government. It even means more to the new Mexican government, and I think that uh, it's it's probably uh, close to being an accurate piece. But, you know, I mean, it is an accurate piece, uh, being I'm hedging. <laughs> My broker, no. Uh, and just to speak about The Economist, last week's Economist was about how problems that France was having, and the French were holistic about that. So oh, I didn't know that. Right. Oh, okay. I'll be very happy about this week's analysis. Right. But my question is... The United States is the only place that doesn't seem to care. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Bond rating. <laughs> The, uh, one of the most interesting, uh, entertaining statements that came out at the, during the beginning of the most recent recession, the Lehman Brothers collapsed, was Lula's statement that this recession was, was caused by men with blue eyes. Right? Right. So, White men with blue eyes. Yeah. Somehow Brazil has managed, it seems to me, Brazil has managed to, to exist in two parallel worlds. And that is this leader of the South-South G77 
sort of anti-capitalist. Right. But yet they're engaged and completely uh, intertwined with the traditional capitalist free market world, and they live simultaneously in both. How did, first of all, do you, do you see it that way? And if so, how did how do they do that? How did they manage to, to leverage both both arenas? Uh, that's a that's a that's a, a good question. They do that very very well. In part, I think it's just that they've they really have made a decision to try to avoid being the enemy of anybody. You know, in other words, you know, they really sort of work hard not to sort of be perceived as, you know, they, they always want to be perceived as the good guys. And they've done a remarkable job when you think about all the quarrels and disputes and uh, in Latin America between, you know, Chile and Argentina, Chile and Bolivia, Chile and Peru, Peru and Bolivia, Peru and Ecuador. I mean, they all have something that they're fighting over. And Brazil, every time, they, I mean, they got into two conflicts in South America in the past uh, year. One with... Uh, Bolivia over the, the Bolivia nationalized Petrobras uh, facilities in, and you know they sent over you know the minister of uh, energy and they sent over a presidential advisor and they sort of patched it up. I mean they, they just went right at it with Paraguay. Now it wasn't uh, they, they they had some question about the distribution of of, of benefits from the. It, it Taipu Dam, and uh, again, uh, Brazilians immediately sort of went and they sort of made an arrangement that they gave Paraguay a little bit more, it wasn't enough. Paraguay is not totally happy, but you know, they just keep having this ability uh, to sort of uh, find common ground, even with the United States, where you know, the United States gets its back up terribly on things like, uh, you know, Brazil's relationship with Iran and its defense of Iran's nuclear program. Uh, but somehow, you know, Obama goes to Brazil and, you know, he's welcomed there and he makes these speeches and then Dilma comes to Washington. She, I mean, in other words, Brazilians have this capacity for... Uh, now, uh, left, right, uh, they seem to get along with, you know, they're just not in, 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 in quarrels with, I mean, you try to find the country that they're really in a serious quarrel, and the closest might be the United States. Yeah, I was going to say, it's probably that. Yeah, and, and the United States, I mean, uh, I tell you, you know, I've had long conversations with our ambassador in Brazil, and he thinks this is the best relationship we've ever had. I mean, this is what he, and the Brazilians say, I mean, I was shocked once, this very left-wing advisor to Lula, who was head of, he was the advisor for foreign policies, now the advisor to Dilma, uh, very, uh, you know, totally man of the left, he sort of was a guerrilla, and he's, you know, and he's, uh, was an academic, and uh, uh, we were on a panel once in the Dominican Republic of all places, and uh, I said, you know, we're not afraid of this. You know, Lula had just been inaugurated, I guess, or, or would recently come to power. And I said, look, the United States is not afraid of left-wing Brazil. Look, you know, we're as good friends now as we were during the Fernando Enrique Cardoso era. And we love Fernando Enrique Cardoso. And he slammed the, the, the table and he said, wait a minute. And I says, and he interrupted me, he says, I didn't want to say, you're wrong. It's not as good as it was during the Fernando Enrique. It's better. That's the, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a certain quality that they, they have managed to, and you know, it may be, and I think that it will be, if they continue their rise and they continue to want to have influence, they have to make choices, and those choices are going to put them in so sort of, they're going to have to choose one or the other. They can't, you know, the one country, the two countries, let me say, they have two countries they have free trade agreements with besides Mercosur. Only two. You know what they are? Israel and Palestine. 
<laughs> I mean, no other country could do that. Uh, you know why? Because they, they wanted to do something for Palestine. Someone came up with the idea, why not give them free trade? Okay. So then, you know, the Israelis, you know, that would, they say, okay, we'll do Israel too. <laughs> and of course, they did one up on the United States, which only has one with Israel. In our conversation earlier this morning, you said uh, that uh, you had visited Mexico recently. Yeah. And that there tended to be sort of conversations that reforms of various types right. could be a distinct possibility. Could you expand on your experience there and also the kinds of reforms that people are considering? Well, it's, it just was very interesting to me to go to Mexico and... Um, you know, we always hear about the, you know, Mexico needs reforms. We mentioned the energy sector, the fiscal sector, uh, the labor reform, I think I mentioned as well. And there's a education reform. And uh, somehow, uh, and uh, these have been on, you know, around for a long time. And every uh, government says they want to do more on these. And... Uh, I was just surprised going to Mexico. This was in late September, actually. Um, and uh, mainly on the energy side. I was going with somebody that works on energy for the dialogue. And I was just surprised to find not only was the transition team and uh, the pre-people uh, all, you know, sort of intent on making these reforms work. But the PAN people leaving the government were, they saw this as really, uh, you know, in, particularly in private, that, you know, the PAN might become irrelevant if it didn't participate early on in this new government, because that it, it really had lost a lot of its prestige and uh, uh, it couldn't make the reforms it wanted to. And the only way that it could begin to really uh, show itself was through working with the with the with the with the with the pre and then we talked to several people on the left the PRD uh, including two of their former presidential candidates who were absolutely willing to talk about these reforms as well energy reform labor reform and I was just surprised that you know that they didn't say no we don't you know they were skeptical that the pre government would make those reforms they were skeptical that anybody could make those reforms given the sort of uh, politics of the country. But they were all talking, they realized that, you know, the status quo in several areas was just not going to work anymore. And uh, I was surprised by the degree of, uh, of uh, you know, I, I wouldn't call it optimism quite or confidence, but that, you know, that, and there was a basically, you know, in each area, uh, you could sense what the content of the reform was. And on energy, it was in great depth. I mean, we, we explored it. But, and it was just, uh, I was jokingly said, you know, I hadn't heard this much talk about reform since uh, Carlos Salinas was president uh, back 20 years ago. Revolution right, in the, the 70s, and, and yet now it's importing, I think, like 50,000 tons of corn a year. Uh, it, you know, farmers have left left the farm. Uh, so, you know, right. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I really don't have an answer because I, I, I just I just don't. I have not been in any conversations about that. You know, not that I try to get a conversation and someone said, no, we're not going to talk about it. It just, it, has never, it hasn't come up and I, I just have no real sense. Uh, certainly, uh, both the uh, Brazilians and the Chileans and the Argentines have shown that a modern, uh, mechanized, uh, technical, agricultural sector can bring enormous gains. Uh, I just don't know if that's in the cards for Mexico or not, or whether a small kind, of, I just don't know. Yeah, I mean, Mexico, I think, was uh, one of these victims of the IMF where they had to 
quit subsidizing their yeah. agriculture in order to get the loans. And it's happened in Egypt, too. Part of what was behind the, uh, the revolutions there because of, of the spike in uh, yeah, but I think they also had a, because of NAFTA, cut a lot of the uh, protective tariffs and protection and the health protections. And so, I mean, they, they sort of really left the agriculture open. I mean, that was uh, something that the U.S. insisted on. And I think that was done over a number of years. I mean, it didn't all start when NAFTA. But now most agriculture is, I think, you know, coming under NAFTA and, and, and open and, and not protected. Uh, you know, uh, corn exports to Mexico from the United States under NAFTA, and NAFTA was passed around 94, 95. It was a 10-year window, and so that about 2004, 2005, all of a sudden the United States was allowed to uh, export uh, corn, and uh, the Mexican government had not done anything with the farmers that were small farms. Uh, to help them transition to different products or to you know improve their productivity, so they got they got really slammed them uh, when that you know well, and, and when you leave the land, you know leaving land fallow in the United States is a good thing. Yeah. The land kind of recovers. Yeah. In Mexico, that's not the case. It, you, you leave the land fallow, and it reverts back to the desert. Desert, yeah. And uh, so they're. The more this goes on, the more Mexico loses its capacity yeah. to feed itself. Mm -hmm. And it may have lost it already. Uh, this is problematic when we start impose, you know, mandating 40% of our corn goes to ethanol yeah. production. That drives uh, prices up like 21%. Well, maybe you could answer a question that I've had that I never quite understood. And the, 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 the debate was very hard about the question of for a long time, uh, Mexicans uh, were unhappy with high-priced corn from the United States. Uh, no, low-priced corn from the United States competing, sorry. And they said, this is going to drive our farmers, you know, that's... And then, uh, when the price of corn went up and the tortillas became expensive, everyone was criticizing high-priced corn. So they're either they're, corn is just sort of a, a problem, because it Well, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of when, when corn prices spike, there wasn't, since farmers had left the farm. OK, the there wasn't any to fill it. had reverted over. There wasn't a shock absorber okay. where they could, even if the Mexican government wanted to subsidize corn, it wasn't going There wasn't, to OK, OK. Very well. Question. Question. Yeah. Kurt. This is an easy one, right? To go out on a high. Question is just based on perception. I think that for in the 80s or 70s, Mexico was uh, like a cultural center of Latin America. So it spreads soft power around the region. But now my perception is that there's a steady decline on that soft power. And there's. Do you have an explanation? Or is that my view or huh that that's that's very interesting because I think you know just thinking of well I think that that I mean you know maybe the same explanation just uh, first I think that was actually Mexico and Argentina together had that sort of uh, kind of influence in other words is the two cultural centers um, I don't, I don't mean, that. you know, one thing I'm watching today that reminds me of what you're saying is just Spain, you know, has been trying very hard to maintain its relationship with Latin America. It's the one thing that Spain sort of brings to Europe, so to speak, is its special access to Latin America. And the Latin Americans over time seem to have become less and less... Uh, uh, focused on Spain, less, you know, they become more and more indifferent, and particularly with the economic crisis now, it's not only culturally they've become indifferent, but economically. And I just think that it's just, uh, maybe it's a maturing of the other, in other words, that it's, you know, you know, you have uh, cultural booms in places like Colombia and Peru, uh, uh, 
Brazil itself never saw never never saw them as as really focal points, and uh, I think you know uh, that just you're seeing you know just like you're seeing globally you know that the 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 the, the, the rising of the rest, and so that the focal points become less less uh, important. But I, I, I'm not sure. That's it's a good question. Hey, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much.